Okay, let's get started. Hi, everyone. This is Gift Learning Classics and Trends. We are a weekly reading group. Uh, it's very simple. Every week we read a paper, except you don't really have to read it because someone comes to the event and present a paper. You listen to it. Um, so it's been going on for five years. Um, and because it's our own thing, sometimes I want to add some novelty to it. So sometimes it's not just a paper, we would have a small panel, we have a discussion around a topic. And in this case, it's a large project. So DALI 2, I feel like one talk about the paper wouldn't do its justice. So I sort of arranged um, a series of talks around DALI 2. So today is about the paper of it, but a week later and two weeks later will be about the deploy deployment of it, the engineering effort, and the safety comms and policy concerns. Because I think DALI 2 really represents the, the AI frontier right now. And, and we are starting to see that AI is no longer just research of a paper, but more of a product and more of like deeper and deeper in people's lives. So I think we should um, try to get this discussion started. So today, very happy to have Aditya here with us. Uh, so we're starting with the paper part of DALI 2. And as usual, I do a small interview with the interviewer um, asking a question about the background. It's really short. Um, and they get to pick a question from a list of questions I sent out. So Aditya picked this one. What is an underrated skill for an ML researcher? Yeah, I think I think one that people often don't talk about a lot is just the ability to um, like take an idea from a paper or um, a list of experiments from a hypothesis that you might have and just be able to like implement the experiments like cleanly, quickly and get rigorous results out of it. Um, it sounds kind of simple, but it usually like the steps you need to get a rigorous result and kind of implement everything carefully, not make mistakes and uh, making sure all the details are correct actually can involve a lot of work. And oftentimes for these large projects, um, getting to the final result is like a series of a thousand small steps, each of which makes the result a little bit better and better. And of course, over the course of the development of a project, there's often these big jumps in quality. Um, but a lot of this is just enabled by like careful small scale ablations and things like that. Thank you. Yeah, I love it. Um, I realized I made a mistake and forgot to disable the waiting room. So I'm so glad that we were recording. Um, but now it should be all fixed. Okay. Cool. Um, we can, yeah, get to the talk if you're ready. Sure. Share. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, as a warning, I, I got sick yesterday and I think I mostly recovered, but I might be coughing a bit during the talk, so please excuse the interruptions. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, today I'll be talking a little bit about DALI 2, uh, which is uh, a joint work between me, Prafil, Alex, Casey, and Mark. So a year ago, we uh, we wrote about a system called DALI-1, which is a model for text-to-image generation. Um, so you give it a caption, and then it generates images that match the caption. Um, what was cool about it is that a single model trained on a diverse data set of images and text was capable of like a broad range of different capabilities, including, for example, like anthropomorphizing vegetables, um, writing text on various surfaces, and like combining two unrelated concepts in an interesting way. So a year after that, we released DALI 2. And there's two um, surface level differences between DALI 1 and DALI 2. Um, so the first is that the images are much higher resolution. So DALI 1 had kind of blurry 256 pixel images, and DALI 2 has uh, much sharper 1024 pixel images. Um, the second is that DALI 2 uh, is not only a lot faster to interact with, but also a lot more efficient to serve. So this makes it so that we can offer it to more people and the experience of playing around with the model in, a, in an interactive feedback loop is a lot more enjoyable. So <clears throat> there's three capabilities I'd like to talk about today that 
were not emphasized online as much as just the pure text to image generation. And some of these capabilities were kind of uh, a big reason uh, for the motivation behind this approach. So the first is in painting, um, which you may have heard about uh, our previous model Glide uh, 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 had it. And uh, there's a previous paper palette from Google Brain uh, that also spoke about in painting. Um, but there's two other features, variations and text tips um, that people don't mention as much online and uh, that for which we would still like to roll out some interesting features into production later. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about what these features do and then uh, kind of talk through how they're implemented in terms of like uh, the machine learning side of things. Um, so here is an interface that kind of uh, introduces the two capabilities I mentioned, which are um, variation or at least one of the capabilities, which is variations. So this is kind of a separate mode from text to image generation that allows you to kind of iteratively create images. So the first thing you can do is you can click on an image and then uh, the model will generate more images like it. So I can do this for a few images. So the second thing this interface lets you do is you can take, I don't know, two images. So this one here, and let's say this one here, and we can blend them together. So here are the intermediate samples from the diffusion model while it's running. So you can see on the very left, uh, the images are most like the ceramic. And on the right, the images are more like the poster. And uh, each row kind of is one trajectory that's going between the first image and the second image. So this works um, for like a bunch of different things. Um, you can combine two like um, cartoon characters and interpolate between them, um, or even like kind of do this with images that you would get from San Francisco. So I think this is a picture um, that I took in the Mission District of San Francisco while I was walking to work. So you can see all of the different images kind of are similar uh, in that they have the same concepts, but they're reassembled in, in different ways. So this is another cool interface that's uh, kind of like enabled by the method that's used for DALI2. So, First, I'll go into the building blocks for DALI2, which are CLIP and Diffusion. So CLIP is a model that uh, we released alongside with DALI1 uh, over a year ago. And it's a model that efficiently learns visual concepts from natural language supervision. So what it does is it uses um, contrastive pre-training to learn uh, visual representations from uh, images and paired captions. So at every step of crit training, CLIP gets um, 32,000 images and their corresponding captions. And from these 32,000 images and captions, we form all N squared um, pairings of images with all, all of the other captions. So along the diagonal of this matrix that you see here uh, is uh, the embedding of uh, every image, uh, or sorry, let me back up a little bit here. So given the 32,000 images and captions, we encode the images with an image encoder and we encode the captions with a text encoder and both are transformer models. So once the images and captions are encoded, we compute all n squared dot products between all of the image embeddings and all of the caption embeddings. So along the diagonal of this matrix here are the dot products between um, the embeddings of all of the images and the embeddings of all of the corresponding captions. So the correct caption for each image. And the off diagonal entries in this matrix are the dot products between uh, the embeddings for the images and the embeddings for all of the mismatching captions. So what CLIP is trained to do uh, is to maximize the cosine similarity um, along the diagonal of this matrix and minimize the cosine similarity along the off diagonal uh, of this matrix. So this makes it so CLIP is basically trying to match up the embedding 
of every image with the embedding of every caption. And if you have a large batch size of 32,000 images, you can imagine that this task might get difficult because um, for every uh, correct caption that you have for an image, you also have several close, uh, close ranking captions that are like almost correct, but not quite it. So this forces Clip to kind of learn about the features and images and text that relate them, um, that relate the two together. Uh, so here's pseudocode that implements the objective I just described. So we encode the captions, uh, the images with the image encoder, the captions uh, with the text encoder, and then we compute the dot products, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, then we normalize them and just use a cross entropy loss to um, do what I mentioned earlier, which is maximize the cosine similarity for the dot products along the diagonal and then minimize the cosine similarity um, along the off diagonal entries. So the nice thing about Clip is once it's trained, we can use it as a zero shot classifier over any collection of uh, visual concepts. So the way this works is suppose we have a, a list of labels like plane, car, dog, bird, and so on. What we can do is convert each of these words into a caption, for example, by just substituting it in a photo of uh, an object where object is like plane, car, dog, and so on. And then given a new image, we just compute the dot product between every image, uh, between the image embedding and all of the captions that we just encoded. And uh, the highest dot product can be taken uh, as the prediction. So this is pretty nice because uh, previously in computer, uh, people used to kind of, it was common to train uh, a classifier uh, for, uh, if you had a classification task that you wanted to do, it was pretty common to retrain a new classifier for that particular task um, using you, you know, a custom data set um, where you take something like a pre-trained model, um, fine tune a new classification head on your task and so on. Whereas now you can just take a single pre-trained model uh, and any collection of uh, visual concepts and then uh, use it uh, basically uh, zero, in a zero shot manner um, as a classifier for any collection of categories. So the second thing I'll talk about briefly is diffusion. I won't have time to cover all of the details in this talk, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Um, so the way diffusion works is it, we train a model to reverse a corruption process that's applied to clean images. So on the very right, you see a clean image and the corruption process that's applied to it um, is denoted by this uh, transition density Q of XT given XT minus one. And what this corruption process does is uh, for every step of the corruption process, it adds a little bit of Gaussian noise to the image. And after T steps of this corruption process, the image is basically indistinguishable from pure noise. So diffusion involves training a generative model that reverses every step of this corruption process. So given a noisy version of an image, which might involve just uh, which might be an image with a tiny amount of noise added to it or a large amount of noise added to it, the model will be trained to undo one step of the corruption process. Um, and in the process of doing this, the model kind of has to learn what might have been erased at every step of this corruption process. Um, which it, So it's kind of learning to generate the details that might have been lost. And so if the model is good enough, what we can do is start from pure noise as, as, as is shown on the left, and then just run the model um, t times to kind of reverse a hypothetical corruption process that might have been applied to the image. And uh, when we do this, we end up with like a clean image after t steps. Um, so here's just an animation of this. Okay. So um, on the left are the details for training. So we sample a clean image and then a time step um, between one and big T. Uh, and then in the argument to epsilon sub theta, we add uh, the amount of noise to the image uh, given by the time step. And that's the square root alpha bar T uh, and so on. Um, so the so the objective that's normally used for um, image modeling is called epsilon prediction. And what that means, so there's many ways to train a diffusion model. Um, 
you can train a diffusion model at every step of the corruption process to predict what the clean image was. So output its best guess for what the clean image was at every step. Or you can train the diffusion model to predict the noise vector that was added to the image. Um, and it turns out empirically that predicting the noise vector, basically the displacement from the clean image, tends to work better for image modeling. And so that's the objective that's shown here in the epsilon prediction. So it's quite simple. We're just training a denoising autoencoder over um, T steps. And once that's done, we can sample from the model, which is what's uh, shown on the right. Um, okay. So uh, this is like a diagram that shows the full unclipped stack that's used for DALI2. Um, the part above the dashed line is clip, and clip is totally frozen for the purpose of training DALI2. So once we train clip, we don't modify it anymore um, for the purpose of training the generative models. Um, so there's two parts to DALI2. One is called the prior, and one is called the decoder or the unclip model. So um, what the decoder does is it takes uh, an image embedding, uh, so a, uh, an image embedding from the clip image encoder, and it's trained to output an image that is consistent with this image embedding. So this is a diffusion model. Um, so that allows us to kind of invert what the clip image encoder um, does, which is map images to embeddings. And this mapping is lossy, so the clip image encoder won't preserve all of the details of the image in the embedding. So this image decoder kind of is trained to take the clip image embedding and uh, fill in all of the details that are necessary to uh, generate a um, That's not enough for us to sample uh, images from scratch, though, because um, we still need to get a clip image embedding given a caption. So that's where the prior model comes in. We, the prior model takes a caption and then generates a clip image embedding um, that is consistent with the caption. And that's also a diffusion model. So now given both of these models, uh, we can generate an image from scratch. Um, I'll go into more details about the motivation behind why we'd wanna do something like this. But the gist of it is that um, Clip learns a lot of information about what makes images kind of perceptually meaningful to humans. So a lot of stuff about aesthetics, styles, um, world knowledge, and so on. And this kind of approach allows us to focus uh, on modeling those bits that are learned by Clip first, and then to train a separate model that uh, uh, fills in all of the details necessary to create a realistic image once we have the Clip embedding. Uh, so this allows us to kind of focus a lot on aesthetics and style and so on, which are kind of the strengths of uh, DALI. Ditya, can I ask a question here? Uh-huh. Um, you said that it wouldn't work so well to feed directly the clip embedding to the decoder. Um, can you talk about more about why this is? Um, it seems like those two embeddings should be in the same space. Is it just yeah. practically so, work super well? I'll, I'll, I actually have a diagram. Okay, okay. Great. Uh, uh, yes, you can do it and it sort of works, but it's not as good as um, uh, using the prior. Basically, those two manifolds are not aligned. Okay. E even after clip training has finished. Hmm. So, just to review, here's the process of generating an image from a caption. Um, first, you get text citation. <coughs> And then we use the prior to sample a clip image representation given the caption. And finally, we use the unclip diffusion model to generate an image um, given the caption and the image embedding. So yeah, uh, the question Jason just asked, like, why do we need a prior? Like clip is trained to match the image embeddings to the text embeddings. So you could just imagine uh, training the decoder to take to map uh, image embeddings to images, but then add times to do texting instead. Um, and this works, but not quite as well as using the prior. And I'll have a slide to illustrate this in a little bit. Um, so first, just uh, some information about the training compute that was used for the models in the paper. Um, so the clip model that we used is a vidh16 uh, image encoder. 
Um, so it's a little bit bigger than the largest clip model we released, which is the vitl slash 14. And the prior that's um, used to model the clip image embedding that uses an amount of training compute that's commensurate with uh, GPT-2. Um, the unclipped diffusion model is a version of uh, Glide, which uh, we wrote about in previous work, except uh, it's conditioned on the clip image embedding instead of only the caption. And finally, the upsamplers are relatively small um, uh, ADM net models. Each is only a few hundred million parameters. Um, and that's primarily so they can run quickly. Um, and basically for training, we use a 50-50 mix of uh, the data sets described in the clip and Dolly one papers. Okay, so back to the question, why do we need a prior? Um, so this kind of matrix uh, shows three approaches for sampling from um, the unclip stack. So when we look at the image here, we train it with um, where the, we train it such that the caption is dropped out randomly 10% of the time and the image embedding is dropped out randomly 10% of the time as well. And the reason we do this is so that we can use classifier-free guidance, um, which is a technique that trades off diversity for coherence in diffusion models. Um, so basically all diffusion models uh, uh, make use, or this, it's very common to make use of this technique for diffusion models. Um, and it's a bit like temperature reduction, but, um, uh, tends to work a little bit better, or actually a lot better. So the main message of Glide was that um, our previous work was that um, uh, kind of the predominant way of using clip with diffusion models in the past was a technique called uh, clip-guided diffusion. But what we found is that classifier-free guidance uh, results in more co coherent images and works better than clip-guided diffusion um, and doesn't need uh, a clip model during sampling. So, okay, so we can, because we drop out the image embedding 10% of the time and the caption 10% of the time, we can sample uh, from the image decoder using only the caption, and that's the top row. Um, the second row shows what happens when you sample from the image decoder using only the text embedding. Um, so we don't use the prior model. And the third row shows what happens um, when you sample from the decoder um, by first running the prior to get an image embedding and then using that image embedding. So the second row still looks pretty good, but uh, the third row qualitatively is a little bit better. And in terms of metrics, the FID and uh, all of the other sample quality metrics are, are much better. Um, can I ask a question? Sure. Can... I wonder uh, if it makes a difference. Um, I'm not sure if you guys tried, but if it makes a difference to unfreeze the, the clip encoder and just train everything together without a prior? Um, that could work. So you'd have to train the prior in a second stage then. So you train the image, you train clip jointly with the image decoder first, and then you train the prior in a second stage. Um, my question would be, you need the prior because the, the embedding space was a little bit unmatched, but imagine yeah. you don't, uh, you take a pre-trained clip, but you don't freeze it. Instead, you let it be fine-tuned. Would that make the unmatching problem better? And would that not uh, solve the problem of, not, of having a prior? Um, I guess, why do you think that training clip jointly with the diffusion model would cause the image embeddings to be matched better to the text embeddings? Because um, if I think about it, what this, what I think this would do is cause more information about the image to be put into the um, clip image embedding. Where we should put? Um... It's kind of like training clip jointly with the reconstruction loss. So it would help like put more information into the embedding that um, it might not get from its training objective, but I don't think it would or at least I don't see how it would cause the image embeddings to be better aligned with the text embeddings. Okay. Yeah. It's a cool thing to try though. Quick, quick question over. Uh -huh. um, so uh, just to clarify, the reason for having the prior at all is because 
in the underlying clip embeddings, the like image embeddings are all over here and the text embeddings are all over here and contain different information in them. So text embeddings may not have a yeah. lot of the image related details that aren't semantic. Is that is that about right? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's and in fact, uh, of the imaging can take a lot more information than a text embedding, um, simply because an image embedding has to achieve a high dot product with any caption that might mention uh, a detail in the image. Whereas a text embedding should achieve low dot products with uh, any image that doesn't contain the detail in the text embedding, the detail in the text embedding. Uh, so it kind of has to be invariant to all of the distractors. So in a sense, the image embedding is something like a union of all of the concepts that someone might write about in the image. But the text embedding is sort of like the intersection of all images that might uh, that might contain what's described in the text embedding. So that's one reason why the two manifolds aren't, aren't quite matched up. OK, so why use clip? Um, so there's a few reasons for this, uh, and one of which I mentioned uh, a little while ago, which is uh, the decoder can now inherit all of the knowledge from clip, which includes knowledge about aesthetics, um, about the world, and so on. Uh, and the next three, uh, so the second is that we can now use uh, language-guided image manipulation, which I'll go into more detail uh, in a bit. The third is what I just mentioned, which is uh, I, I mentioned that like diffusion models normally use a technique called classifier-free guidance um, at test time, and this like drastically improves the sample quality. And with unclip, we get a better quality diversity trade-off um, than uh, if we use classifier-free guidance with like a glide style model that doesn't have uh, an intermediate representation, like unclip. Um, and the reason for that is you can apply classifier-free guidance separately to the two models. One is the prior model, which is a diffusion model, and the second uh, being the image encoder, which is also a diffusion model. And so um, this allows us to uh, kind of use much higher guidance scales for the image diffusion model than we could otherwise with uh, a model like Glide. Um, and the problem if you use very high guidance scales normally with diffusion models is that the images get really saturated. Um, and the fourth point is uh, we can invert clip representations in cases where um, we think it's making a stupid mistake. And that allows us to see kind of what it might be thinking. Okay, so next I'll go into a little bit of detail about how Unclip allows for all of these image manipulations that I showed in the demo and um, the text guided uh, image transformation that I mentioned. So um, given any image, we can use uh, Clip and the image decoder to get a bipartite latent representation that perfectly reconstructs the image. And the way this is done is first we take the image and we encode it with clip to get the clip image embedding z underscore i. And then given this clip image embedding, we condition the image decoder on it and use a technique called DDIM inversion, which gives us a noise vector such that if we started the sampling process for diffusion with this noise vector, we would exactly reconstruct this image. And DDIM is an alternative procedure for sampling from diffusion models, where we only use uh, introduced stochasticity into the first step, and all of the future steps are deterministic. And with DDIM, the diffusion model basically becomes something like a normalizing flow, which allows you to go from an input back to the latent. Um, and uh, the procedure for doing this reverse process is described in um, this paper by Praful and Alex. Um, that I've mentioned here. So now given these two pieces of information, we can perfectly reconstruct the image by just uh, running sampling uh, with the image decoder conditioned on both pieces of information. Um, so the way to think about these two variables is that the clip image embedding encodes all of the details in the image that are recognized by clip. 
Um, and this DDIM noise describes all of the residual information that's discarded by CLIP. So CLIP only cares about stuff in images that people talk about online um, in captions and so on. So CLIP uh, usually is not very sensitive to orientation. Um, so if a person is tilted to the right or facing the camera directly, um, CLIP won't really recognize that. And you can see that in, in the samples as well. So the first feature variations uh, that I showed where you kind of click on an image and the model generates uh, more images like it, that we do just by fixing the clip image embedding after encoding the image and just varying uh, the DDIM noise. So here are some examples. The image on the left is the input and the images on the right are the output. So you can see what this is kind of showing us is um, what details in the image are recognized by clip and all of the things that you're seeing changed are details in the image that's that are not recognized by clip so okay. clip yeah um what's the distribution of variants that you apply for ddm is it a straightforward distribution or do you do you learn that um so the prior for diffusion is always an isotropic normal um what ddm lets you do is um just so the DDIM reverse, uh, the DDIM inversion procedure just lets you take an image and then get back the latent that would have resulted in it. But the prior is still the same. Okay. okay. Um, but is DDIM deterministic or it is stochastic? Really? Um, only the first step is not deterministic, where you use the noise. But then in DDIM, all of the future steps are stochastic, or are not stochastic rather. There's actually a parameter eta in DDIM that interpolates between the original objective um, described in Jonathan Ho's paper and um, the variant where uh, the extreme case where we only introduce noise into the first step. So yeah, um, these kind of samples show you what's the information that's recognized by CLIP, like um, the space background, the orange costume, the mask, and so on and all of the details that you see changed like the exact orientation of the person the camera angle are details that are kind of not recognized by clip um, here's a pancake in the shape of the open ai logo and you can see all of the samples kind of have the same geometric structure roughly but the color of the plate the details of the table and so on are different and here's the final example so the second thing uh, we can do is interpolation, where we take an image, encode it into this bipartite representation that I mentioned, and we do the same thing to a second image and spherically interpolate um, between both pieces of information. Um, and here is an example where we're interpolating between the ceramic by Picasso and MC Escher's spirals. And um, there's a few trajectories here. And the final thing you can do uh, is called text diffs, where, um, and the motivation for this is, if you remember uh, way back when Wirtivec came out, Wirtivec showed that you can use these neural embeddings to form analogies like um, king minus man plus woman uh, is close to the embedding for a queen. So one thing we could try to do is well, CLIP learns a multimodal embedding space involving both images and text. So is it possible to form these same types of analogies, but using both images and captions instead of only text? Uh, and can we use that to manipulate images? And uh, here's an example of how we might do that. So we encode an initial caption like a photo of a cat, and then a final caption like a photo of a Super Saiyan cat, and then we subtract the two and normalize it, and, and then we call this the text diff vector. So then what we can do is take uh, the embedding of uh, an encoded image and then move it slightly towards this text diff vector. And if you think about it, this is kind of like the king minus man plus woman analogy because uh, this text diff vector is like the change we want to apply, like a before and after, and we can try applying it to a new image. So is illustrated by um, this process here, where we interpolate between the image embedding, the text diff vector, using a weight that's typically between 0.25 and 0.50. And we fix the DDIM noise just so that when you're interpolating the image, 
still looks as close as possible to the original in all of the details that we don't want to be changed. And as it turns out, um, this actually works in a pretty general way. So you can change art styles, architecture styles, age, um, and even season. So the final thing I'll cover is um, diagnosing stupid mistakes. So I mentioned earlier that sometimes clip makes a dumb mistake when we use the zero shot classification method. Um, and one cool example of this was in the multimodal neuron analysis um, blog post that we released a little while after clip. And one of the findings in that blog post is you can fool clip, like you know how there's all this literature on adversarial attacks or neural networks. Um, it turns out that you can fool clip just by like writing the name of another class on a piece of paper and taping it to the object that you're trying to classify. And if you do that, like for example, write iPod on a piece of paper and tape it to an apple. That's actually enough for the zero shot classification to tell you that you're looking at an iPod and not an apple. Um, so then the question is, does Clip really think that this is an image of an iPod? Or um, is it a limitation of the zero shot classification approach where we're just comparing um, the image and the caption using a simple dot product? And as it turns out, if you invert the embedding of this Apple with a piece of paper taped to it uh, and generate an image using unclip. You can see that the embedding still clearly preserves the information about, uh, about, their, uh, about an apple being in the image. And sometimes it even reconstructs uh, an apple with a piece of paper taped to it. Uh, and same for the pizza. So this suggests that uh, some of the failure modes of clip are not from lack of understanding, but actually just from the simple dot product comparison, kind of missing um, some more subtle things uh, that can happen in an image. And I think there's been a lot of recent work on fine tuning image back, uh, pre-trained image backbones to do classification, for example, by conditioning a captioning model on the features of, the, of a pre-trained vision backbone, and then training it to be a captioner. And I would guess that those methods would not be susceptible to these types of um, typographic attacks. Um, and the final thing I'll talk about is limitations of the unclip approach. So unclip uh, is actually worse than our previous work glide for things involving variable binding. And what I mean by that is, um, so imagine that in a given step of training, clip sees uh, an image of a red cube on top of a blue cube unless there's another image in that batch of 32,000 with a blue cube on top of a red cube, Clip won't be incentivized to learn that it's the red cube on top and the blue cube on the bottom. The only thing that the representation would have to do to match up the image to the caption is basically learn an indicator function saying that there's two cubes and red and blue. And so this makes it so that if you encode an image and decode it with unclip, uh, it's oblivious to like which attribute is applied to which object. So for example, if you encode an image of a corgi with a red party hat and a green bow tie, it can swap the two colors. Or if you encode an image with uh, a big cookie and a small glass of milk, it might swap the two attributes when you decode. Um, we made this trade off anyway, just because when we found that creators and artists use the platform, um, they just really like the aesthetics and the styles and the language limitation wasn't like a huge deal. But of course, this is something that we want to fix in future work. Um, one interesting finding is that I did mention in previous slides that we conditioned the unclip model on both the caption and the image embedding. So the hope was that maybe it would learn to use the caption and still learn this information about variable binding anyway. But um, for some reason, there was some kind of encoder starvation issue. And the text embedding from the encoder um, that's trained along with the unclip model tends mostly to be ignored. Cool. Um, so that's it for uh, what I wanted to talk about. Um, there's some references at the end uh, for all of the papers that I mentioned. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to take any questions anybody might have. That's wonderful. Um, I have a question about the text diff part. So can you, first of all, people uh, seem to have 
been confused uh, as we chat in the chat that you showed the example of the super saiyan um, yeah like what what should come out of this example uh that's the first row here oh okay yeah so that difference was added to the cat because yeah. before uh discussing whether only a super saiyan is going to show up without the cat Oh, no, no, yeah. Um, the image on the very left is the input. And from left to right, we interpolate between the input and um, the text div. I see. So this is still the like an interp interpolation then? Yeah, it's like interpolating between the image and the text div. I see. Can we, can we truly do text div? Um, I was imagining you can even do image text div. You haven't since they're in the same embedding now. Yeah. We have a have a um, caption generate something, but then you raise some part of that that concept. Um so you mean subtract two image embeddings or um, um sorry, not quite sure I followed. Can't think I can't think of a good example, but maybe you um you generate an image from a long caption something something and yeah. then you encode an image that is part of that like that, that that's a cat and then you do the subtraction so that when you run unclip the cat is gone oh i see you yeah that would be interesting to try yeah you generate a super saiyan cat and you encode a cat and now you subtract the two embeddings and you feed that through the unclip. Something like that, I don't know. Oh, you mean what happens when you feed in the difference directly into unclip? Yeah. I think you'd probably get like some weird out of distribution um, image. I see. Yeah, I think I tried it before and it just, if you subtract two image images and uh, try to decode that directly, it looks kind of like very messy jarbled image. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because eventually we want to mimic the example in word to back where you subtract men plus women equals queen, that kind of example, right? So when um, are you do subtract cat, add a dog, and do the compositional creation? Yeah. I guess for things like directly adding an object in painting might be a bit easier to do because you can just like erase the part of the image and add an object into that region. Um, text diffs tend to be better for like changes that you can't kind of changes in like style or season or something that are more difficult, like less localized to, to one part of an image. But that makes sense. Yeah, it would be interesting. Cool. Um... Let's do open Q&A. Uh, so we have a raised hand from Ming. Hi, uh, Adina. Uh, nice talk. Thank you. Um, I was wondering uh, two questions. One is about the prior network. Um, I didn't catch uh, how you train it. What's the objective for the network? Uh, maybe, you know, I missed it. And second is it seems like um, the same approach, you can reverse it to do uh, text generation or caption generation, right? Um, maybe uh, you can generate from image bunch of captions and then using those set of captions to do classification um, and give you a better classification results. Have you guys thought about that direction? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so for the, the first question, I didn't mention the objective in the slides, but it is mentioned in our paper. Um, the prior model is trained using the X start objective. Um, and it's just trained to reconstruct uh, clip image embeddings from captions rather than images. Um, and yeah, for the second question, I think there are already works that do things like fine tune GPT style models to do captioning um, given image features. Um, I think you'd want to be careful and probably fine tune the image encoder in addition to the captioner, um, just because you wouldn't want the captioner to be susceptible to the same failure modes of unclip, where if there's a red cube on top of a blue cube, the captioner might give you like a blue cube on top of a red cube. Um, 
so there, there's some subtlety there but yeah in general i think uh applying this approach to captioning is is a is like a pretty promising direction got it thanks Sachet, you're next great um thanks for the talk that was really really cool um and one very obvious question that connects to what you were just saying which is um You've mentioned this limitation of kind of mixing up attributes between different objects in a given image. Um, I'm wondering if you have any hypotheses for kind of how that's possible slash why it happens, because it sounds like in text there should be enough, even just in the word order, to distinguish between, oh, is red modifying bow tie or party hat? So is order somehow lost in the text encoder? Or like how, how could that be possible is, is the question. <clears throat> yeah, I, I mentioned how if clip doesn't get a counter example in the batch of images for the current training step, then it won't be incentivized to learn like which image, which cube is on top and which cube is on bottom, for example. Um, so yeah, if you scale up a, a large enough uh, aim to text model, I think it would eventually learn these kinds of things. But um, in terms of like ImageNet probes and other stuff, um, into text tends to be less efficient than clip. <clears throat> okay, so it's okay. I see that, that makes sense. Um, and then, really quickly, one thing that was discussed a lot in the original clip paper was um, kind of to justify the contrastive design and saying, okay, here's why we did it encoder style. Um, there were a lot of nice graphs about the compute costs of scaling decoders versus. Um, doing the contrastive training and basically saying this is way more feasible. Um, I'm wondering what what changed in between, like what made it possible to do this kind of generation at this level? Like what were the main pieces? Because there are a lot of things that have changed since then, like diffusion models, et cetera. But I'm wondering what you think were the main drivers of being able to do this. Being able to do what? Um, being able to decode and generate instead of like computationally train something that decodes and generates rather than just do the contract. Um, yeah, okay. <clears throat> I think it's just a matter of scale. So like um, we showed in prior work like IGPT that uh, if you just scale up a model that generates images from from scratch, eventually it will still learn good representations if you train a large enough model. It's just much less efficient in terms of compute than something like clip or potentially other objectives like MAE and so on. Thanks. I think the order of raised hands were Tim, Yash, and David. Uh, hey, um, I was wondering for the diffusion prior, um, what architecture you use and like how hard was it to come up with that architecture? Because for images, we just use the like units. But like now you have a diffusion model between um, clip embeddings. So that's fundamentally different than images. Yeah. Uh, this actually just uses a transformer architecture without any downsampling or upsampling. And was it hard to figure that out, like that that works well or? It, um, it wasn't particularly hard, yeah. The main detail is to use the X start prediction instead of epsilon prediction. Okay, cool. Um, and the second question would be when you take an image and you show that you can get like 16 images that are close to it, you say you add noise in the DDIM latent. Um, how do you choose that noise? Do you just um, like, yeah. So the actual way that's done, as I mentioned, uh, um, there's a parameter ADA that interpolates between DDIM and DDPM. Okay. So to get the diversity, we choose ADA to be slightly greater than zero. For example, like 0.1 or 0.2. Okay, cool. Thanks. Hi, Aditya. Um, so what I wanted to ask was specifically on the, the image variation demo. And so I think you introduced DALI 2 by like mentioning a couple of capabilities. And one of those was the image variation. Um, but what I wanted you to elaborate on is like, if we focus on the image variation demo and how exactly you do that, um, what specific design decisions in particular with regards to the training process for DALI 2 enabled that image variation demo? Like what was necessary versus 
not necessary is kind of what I'm asking. Um, kind of works out of the box if you just train a clip condition diffusion model. Um, we didn't we didn't expect it to work that well. <coughs> excuse me, prior to actually trying it. Um, and once we trained the model, this was one of the, the things we were interested in, in exploring. So it was kind of a pleasant surprise to, to see that it worked that well. I see, all right, thank you. David? Oh. Thank you. Um, I just want to say thanks for the talk. It's been um, fascinating, um, very fascinating. Um, you said how the model is not um, not sensitive to the rarely mentioned details, like the orientation and things like that, because you only have, say, 32,000 images, and you often don't get um, those distinctions popping up being important in just 32,000. Um, so, sorry if this is in the paper. I just wondered if you tried um, or, or considered choosing um, captions that are very similar to make it more challenging for the model or the, um, or um, embeddings that are more similar so to kind of giving it more challenging work to do. Yeah, I think there's a line of work on hard negative mining for contrastive approaches. <coughs> Excuse me, where you can augment clip training with like synthetic examples or um, or do things to kind of like use various heuristics to find like um, captions that are more difficult to tell apart from the original um, than, than if you just sampled uniformly from the data set. Um, I think that might help with stuff like this, but um, I'm not too sure how well those heuristics work. I haven't read up so much on, on those papers. Um, there are a few questions from the chat. Basically, they were asking of your opinion after Imogen, um, the model from Google has come out. Seems like you can just use the encoder. Just that's, that was trained solely on text and it worked fine. So do you still think the image prior was useful? And also, if you have to guess next five years, do you think we should use contrastive encoders or just pure text encoder? Yeah. So the T5 encoder and the prior model definitely do different things. And uh, I mentioned that uh, DALI2 has a weakness with things like variable binding, but for things like aesthetics and other types of uh, image understanding that DALI has, Imogen would probably be worse. One example is what David Ha posted a while ago, where if you ask DALI2 to generate um, Darth Vader on the cover of Vogue magazine, uh, Dali 2 will like draw a woman in the right pose with like a stylized mask that matches the magazine and so on. Whereas Imogen will just like paste Darth Vader on the magazine cover. But on the other hand, Dali 2 is like bad at spelling and can't get stuff like red cube on top of blue cube. So I do think there's like merits to both approaches and that uh, conditioning on the clip Im image embedding definitely helps with like some types of image understanding. Um, as for what's going to happen in the future, um, are latency even necessary? I'm not sure. Um, I can see a few directions. Uh, one is like, we find out how to train a single diffusion model that's just good at both representation learning and generation, and there's no need for latency at all. Um, and that would be nice just because of the simplicity. Or we find that it's still beneficial to use latency because um, you need a separate model that can just th churn through data very quickly without attempting to generate all the pixels and just get like a single representation that contains all of the types of understanding that we want. Um, but I don't really know um, what we're going to end up using five years from now. Yeah, and so I personally think we shouldn't forget about the scale um, in that Imogen is a much bigger text encoder. I think because they only have text to train from the, the encoder has to learn so much from so much data. It has to be, it has to have so much capacity. Well, I think clip encoder is smaller, right? Yeah, I do think T5, the 11B T5 probably used more training compute than clip. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we have two raised hands from Yasa and Robin. 
Hello, um, thanks for the presentation. Just like um, sort of like quick um, implementation details. So basically, I mean, I guess like since the models are like sort of big and so on, um, what kind of, you know, uh, layer sharing techniques you use to train these models on multiple GPUs? Um, <clears throat> for Clip, it's pretty easy because you can just do data parallel. Um, um, yeah, so you can just all gather the embeddings and implement the contrastive plus that way. Um, for all the models that we have where um, we can't train on just uh, where we need model parallelism, I, I typically just use parameter sharding just because it's the easiest um, and least fussy to, to work with. Um, yeah, it's quite easy to implement parameter sharding in PyTorch. And, um, once you do it, you can like scale up to pretty large models um, quite efficiently. Um, so that's my preferred technique, but it's probably not the most efficient thing if you're training like very large models. Hi, yeah, thanks for the talk. I, I, my question is a pretty minor point on clip. Um, you use a full N squared matrix uh, for the loss instead of just a handful of positive and negative examples. Can you, is there a reason for that, uh, for, for doing that, doing the full matrix like that? Thanks. Uh-huh. Um, one is it's not that much more expensive to use the full matrix. Um, and if you're encoding all of those images, you might as well. And the second is um, if you would want to reduce the size of that matrix, you'd need to know which examples are like most important to contrast against and, uh, well, I'm not sure the training would be stable with a much smaller batch size. Um, like info and CE, which is the objective uh, on which Clip is based on, basically uses a large number of negative examples to compensate for the fact that <clears throat> um, you're not explicitly normalizing um, as you would with like a self-normalized model or, or other kinds of like maximum likelihood models. So if you used a batch size that's too small, I would guess that training would become unstable as well. And thanks. Im yeah, empirically scaling up the batch size is also one way to use more training compute to get a better model. Um, simply because the larger the batch size, <clears throat> the the higher the probability that you will run into like a hard negative that is more difficult to distinguish from the original caption. Thanks again. Hi, um, I think you briefly mentioned in your talk, but just to confirm my understanding, the two embeddings, um, CLIP and uh, DDIM, the role is that the CLIP, it includes the kind of all the information of the image relevant to the, the captions, while the second one encodes the information, which is typically not included in the captions, such as backgrounds or the directionality of the objects. Is it the right way of understanding? Yeah. Was it like the, the, this two-way embedding, just what, just curious, was it intentional or was it more like a retrospective interpretation? Probably more like a retrospective interpretation. Like we didn't know before training the model that like this was the approach we were gonna use. Um, but it's a nice way of thinking about how the encoding process works, I think. I see, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, I have a question about the cubes, the red and the blue cubes. So you said uh, the model has a problem distinguish of the cube orientation, but how do you know that's the right answer versus uh, like if the prop is just a red and a blue cube connected together, then either way would be correct. But we, we only thought that that's the right order because you said it. How do you know it's not, the caption was, it was actually making an error versus doing exactly what the data showed it. Do you mean like if there are badly labeled examples in the data? Or so, so you when you had that example, you said, oh, I, I forgot which order it was, but you said like blue should always be on top of the red. And then, but what if 
it couldn't tell like what if the cap the original data just said i want a blue and a red cube connected or touching each other oh <clears throat> yeah i mean that would be another potential reason but even if i guess in either case i don't think it would be incentivized to learn what object is on top and what object is on bottom like if the okay. captions didn't mention like um order of uh, stacked objects right um it also wouldn't learn um but there are definitely captions in the data set that talk about left right versus top and bottom okay uh, but yeah yeah, it, yeah that's what i was saying like you need a caption that says the red cube is on top of the blue cube and something like that and then if it doesn't do diversity like it's 50 50 then you know it's doing something wrong i guess that's what i was wondering about okay Thanks. Yeah, but but the caption by itself wouldn't be like you would still need a counter example because otherwise, right. yeah. Right. Okay, thanks. Hey, ha hello, uh, I'm Minjin from Tsinghua University, and uh, I found some observation that uh, the DALI tool uh, sometimes generate uh, inconsistent eyes. Uh, for example, your uh, image of the uh, white cat, some uh, similar image. Have you analyzed the uh, reasons about this uh, artifact? Um, do you mean in humans or in other cases as well? Uh, some uh, uh it, it, I remember some uh, uh maybe uh, clothes and there are also some uh, inconsistent inconsistence of the uh, clothes uh, the, the directions on the clothes or something like that. Um, some of that might just be limitations of the upsampler. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, typically when there's a small amount, there's uh, one pixel in the low res image that needs to be expanded into a lot of detail in the high res image. The upsamplers are intended to run quickly. And so um, sometimes if, if, if details uh, get bottlenecked on the upsampler, they end up looking strange in the in the high res image. Yeah, uh, is that uh, some kind of leak of uh, attention or something, or some operation like that? Have you tried to add attention like uh, what you had done in DALI one is some uh, row based or line based attention to to avoid this problem? Um, we don't use attention in the upsamplers actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this is the reason of the, the, the uh, these artifacts. I mean, uh, have you tried to uh, change uh, the upsampler because it's? I think this uh, training uh, it's the training is very very fast because it's not very hard problem. Yeah, um, I think that's a promising direction, and there are things we could do to make the upsamplers a lot better. But currently, like one of the chief concerns was latency, and uh, we want the upsamplers to be able to run quickly. So I would like to see an approach where um, the upsamplers are still as fast, but um, um, have better quality with the same latency requirements. OK, thank you very much. Okay, um, I think we should stop here. Usually we can go over time, but Aditya, I think today we should let him rest. <laughs> so thanks for still coming, uh, even though you're feeling not so well. Uh, thanks for having me. It was great talking. Yeah, and, and uh, you guys know how to find the Aditya. Yeah, I'm a model mechanic on Twitter. Um, and I think my profile also, well, I can paste my email here. One second. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so feel free to email me if you have any more questions. I'd be happy to to answer. Okay, cool. Yeah, hope you'll have a good rest. And Thanks. Well soon. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks, everyone.